good evening. Yeah, good morning. It's good to see you. Yeah, good morning. Hi, thank you. Okay, ma'am, shall we start the program? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay, good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of Department of Seed Science and Technology, Seed Center, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, we feel privileged to extend our warm welcome to all the dignitaries, guests, scientists, students and friends attending through online and offline for the Golden Jubilee Global Lecture Series guest lecture on Seed Physiology to Seed Vigor. We kindly request you all to stand up for the prayer. Now, we would like to invite our Professor and Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology to welcome the guest. Yeah, good evening to all and good morning to Dr. Allison, ma'am, uh, respected Dean, uh, Postgraduate Studies, Director of Seeds, the guest speaker, Dr. Allison, Allison Povell, alumni of uh, Department of Seed Science and Technology, uh, my dear scientists, uh, PG and PhD students present uh, both online and offline. I wholeheartedly welcoming you all to this uh, Golden Jubilee Global Online Lecture Series. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University is a century old legendary institute in South India, providing agriculture education with the guidance of our respected Vice Chancellor, Madam Ma'am. At present, this prestigious Department of Seed Science and Technology has completed its 50 glorious years. Therefore, in order to celebrate the great occasion, we are organizing this lectures by inviting eminent scientists worldwide. So we have arranged the first lecture by Dr. Stephen uh, Groot, uh, Wengen Seed Center, Wengen University, Netherlands, on June 23rd, ma'am. And second lecture by Dr. Gen Bradford, UC Davis, California, on 3rd February, ma'am. And this is the third lecture. And uh, also we had a fruitful discussion uh, uh, during previous lectures. And I hope you all enjoyed and benefited. So this is our third online lecture. Uh, considering the vast experience of Dr. Alison Powell in seed science, particularly in seed vigor, I request ma'am to deliver the guest lecture for the benefit of the students and faculty of TNAO. Madam is very kind enough to accept our request happily. Thank you ma'am for your generous mind for accepting our invitation and to take part in this great event for celebration of Golden Jubilee year. So Dr. Allison is the chairperson of ISTA Seed Vigor Committee. As a convener, Dr. Powell organized ISTA Symposium during 2010 at Cologne, Germany. I met Madam there. During that time, I had got a great opportunity to meet both Dr. Powell and Dr. Stan Matthews, ma'am, the renowned seed scientist. We both are involved in bringing out many seed vigor tests like electrical conductivity test, controlled deterioration test, and radical emergent test, and the best correlating all those uh, these tests with the field emergence. So with this brief intro about the madam, I feel very proud and honored to welcome you all to this uh, lecture series. And I'm sure that we will have a good deliberations with guest speaker. Thank you for the opportunity. Once again, I'm welcoming you all to this guest lecture. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your uh, welcome address. Next, we would like to request our director, Seed Center, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, to deliver introductory address. I'm happy to share with you that the fifth Golden Jubilee Lecture of Department of Seed Science and Technology, TNAU Coimbatore, organized by the professor and head of the Department of Seed Science and Technology, TNAU, shall be delivered by Dr. Allison A. Powell. I would like to register in this house that I have read the papers published by Dr. Allison and have, have been struck by the depth and clarity of the papers she has published. I take this opportunity to personally acknowledge you, ma'am, since I have quoted many of your publications in the presentations that I have made during the winter schools organized by our department. It also gives me immense pride to introduce to our renowned introduce our renowned speaker to our young audience comprising of 50 postgraduate and doctoral scholars currently studying in Department of Seed Science and Technology, ACNRI Coimbatore, as well as ACNRI Madurai campuses. Our students should realize that they have got a wonderful opportunity to listen to our one of the stalwarts in the field of seed science. I wish to specially thank our professor and head for making this event possible. 
Dr. Alison Powell is a sea technologist who has 45 years of service at Scotland, UK. At first, she was at University of Stirling, later at the University of Aberdeen. She was awarded a higher doctorate in 2004 in recognition of her contribution to seed science and technology. Her research is mostly focused on physiological basis of seed aging and not standing with that, she has used her knowledge to develop tests which we are using at present in our laboratory. They are nothing but the controlled deterioration test, the EC test um, and many other vigor tests, especially the field emergence and uh, the radical protrusion, I mean the radical emergence test. She has worked in collaboration with colleagues from more than 20 countries and has focused on a wide range of crops such as maize, soya bean, peas and many other vegetables. Eventually, she has developed time test vigor test, as I said earlier, such as electrical conductivity, control deterioration test and radical emergent tests of seed vigor. All the three tests are supposed to be gems in the seed vigor examination. We all use them extensively in the Department of Seed Science and Technology, Coimbatore, for our various student thesis research programs. Dr. Alison A. Powell has also involved extensively in ISTA as a member of Vigor Committee from 1995 and has also chaired the Vigor Committee since 2001. Besides, she has been the member of the Executive Committee from 2007 to 2013 and she is also currently chairing Seed Science Advisory Group. She is also the Deputy Editor of the journal Seed Science and Technology. Besides her busy schedule, she has graciously, graciously accepted our invitation to deliver a lecture to us as the part of the Golden Jubilee Lecture Series of Department of Seed Science and Technology. I wish to place on record my sincere thanks to Dr. Alison A. Powell for her gracious presence on screen to enlighten us about the physiology of seed deterioration and seed vigor. My best wishes to the audience online and offline to have a wonderful time with our great speaker, Dr. Alison A. Powell. With these few words, I now hand over the stage to our special guest. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, madam, for your detailed introductory address. Guest lectures provide an important educational experience and can get to understand and perceive the insight and perspective of the guest lecturer's specific field. So with this, now we would like to request our beloved and most respected guest speaker, Dr. Alison A. Powell, School of Biological Sciences, University of Aberdeen, Aberdeen, UK, for delivering guest lecture on Seed Physiology to Seed Vigor. Now the session is over to our guest speaker, Dr. Alison A. Powell. Ma'am, now, yeah. Okay. That's good. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sorry, everybody, for that delay on my part, but I'd like to, first of all, thank very much Professor Manamani and Dr. Umarani for their very kind words and for their welcome to your university. And I actually feel very privileged to be asked to give this presentation at the time of your celebration of your 50th anniversary. It is a great achievement for the university. When I started thinking about your 50th anniversary, as I was saying, when I started thinking about a 50th anniversary, I realised it's actually now 50 years since I began as an undergraduate to work on seed quality. And my main interest throughout my life in, in seed quality work has been to link anything which we've found in seed physiology to something which we see in practice in this case to seed vigour. I have changed as time's gone on. I actually started just working with peas, but then I moved on to other grain legumes, including some tropical grain legumes like chickpea and long bean and cow pea with overseas students. Then moved to a range of vegetables and finally more recently with colleagues to flowers. So, this really illustrates one of the principles I, that I've always felt that any findings that we relate in physiology 
to vigor should be applied to a very wide range of species. And so in my presentation, presentation, I aim to show how aspects of seed physiology are applied to vigor testing in high germination commercial seed lots. I feel it's important to always be working in the context of commercial seed lots because these are the seeds which are received by the farmers and the growers. So what I'm going to do in my presentation, I'm not moving this on, I don't know why it's moving on. When you reverse that, for some reason it's... So in my presentation, I'm going to... and their practical implications. I'll look at seed aging and its use in vigor testing. Then I'll look at differences in germination progress curves and how they relate to vigor testing before bringing these two aspects together to an aging repair hypothesis for seed vigor. And I'll finish by looking at the possibility of future development of vigor tests through automation and molecular methods. So I'll start off by illustrating differences in vigour and their practical implications. Now, if we think about physiological aspects of seed quality, the first which we automatically think about is germination. Now, in this case, we're talking about germination of commercial seeds, and this is maintained at a high level through minimum germination standards and truth in labelling. But despite these high germination standards, we do have problems due to seed vigour. Now, seed vigour has been discussed for many years and definitions put forward. But in 2001, come on, ISTA developed a definition of vigour, which is that seed vigour is the sum of those properties that determine the activity and performance of seed lots of acceptable germination in a wide range of environments. I feel that the key words in this definition is seed lots of acceptable germination, because it is seed lots of acceptable germination that are used in practice by farmers and growers. So we always want when developing diff uh, vigor tests to look at tests which determine the differences in quality of these seed lots with high acceptable germination. Now we can illustrate the differences that we can see in commercial seed lots in this um, table here. Now here we have a list of species and in each case, the figure in brackets is the number of seed lots where the research was done. And we range from species of chickpea, alfalfa and maize through a number of vegetable crops with flower species at the bottom. Now, you can see if we look at the range of germination in each of these pieces of work, germination is high, say from 92 to 100 here, 88 to 98, 86 to 98. But despite these very high levels of germination, if you look at the field emergence or the emergence in modular trays, which we have at the bottom here, we have a very wide range in emergence. You can see here for chickpea with a high germination, emergence range from 43 to 78%. For maize, 92 to 98% normal germination, but a range of 50% in the emergence different seed lots in the field. And we can see the same here in the flower species, if we look at the impatiens, high levels of normal germination, but germination modules between 6 and 66%. So this prop is a problem that we call differences in seed vigour, where high germination lots show differences in their ability to emerge in the field. Now this just gives an example of that emergence. Here we've got a field trials of Phaseolus vulgaris in France. And you can see the different plots here represent different seed lots. This plot obviously emerges well, but you've got a very poor emergence here. That's due to low vigour. Here's an example of a flower species, Tagetes. Good emergence here, 
But look how bad the emergence is here. Very low vigour. And in May's high vigour, good emergence, very poor emergence in the same conditions of these seed lots means it's low vigour. And here we've got one example in modular trays. In modular trays for lettuce, and you, this is a low vigour lot, and you can see in some cases there's empty cells, there's failure to emerge, but overall you've got very big differences in the actual size of the seedlings. You've got some which are very small, some which are very big, very variable. So we can summarise these characteristics of vigour in the next slide. If we look at the impact of low vigour in the field, that of low vigour in the field, where you have poor emergence, you get reduced yield. The exception of this is where you get a cereal such as wheat, which can tiller. And so if there's only a small reduction in establishment, there will be no difference in yield because the plants compensate by tillering. But in many cases, a reduction in yield results from this poor emergence. The seed lots also show less uniform emergence and variable seedling size, and this can reduce the marketable yield. If, for example, you were sowing cabbage in the field and you had variability in emergence, the variable seedling size would lead to differences in the size of the final crop. So this would reduce the marketable yield. In terms of transplant production, poor emergence will give an unpredictable number of transplants produced. And the number of transplants produced is very important. If this number is, doesn't, isn't achieved, it will mean a waste of greenhouse space, heating, lighting, and of course, compost. And these low vigor seeds for transplants, again, can give less uniform emergence and variable seed size, giving reduced marketable yield. And this is what you could see in the lettuce in the earlier slide. And then low vigor can also impact the storage potential. And low vigor seeds shows poor retention of germination compared to high vigor seed. So we've seen so far that low vigor has a significant impact on emergence and yield. Now I want to go on and look at seed aging and its use in bigger testing. Now here you can see the seed survival curve, which looks at germination with time. And I've got a line across this curve indicated at a minimum germination for sale of seed lots. And the curve starts off with a very slow decline in germination and then a very rapid decline. And this is reflecting the aging of the seeds with time. Now, if we think about these three seed lots, and their position on the survival curve, A is very early in the curve, so it's physiologically young, B is a bit older, and C is much older. So they have high germination, but because of their position on the survival curve, they have different physiological age. So we could relate to people, seed A, seed lot A could be a 16 year old boy, seed lot C, a 60 year old man. They're both alive, but they might be less vigorous at 60 than at 16. Now, these differences in aging can occur on the plant before harvest, which we call weathering, during processing, during storage, and even during transport from the store to the farmer and grower. And we can use seed aging in vigor testing. And this is used in the ISTA validated tests, which are included in the ISTA rules. And it's important to emphasize that these tests, which are validated, have been shown by rigorous research to relate to an, an outcome of vigor, such as emergence, and also to be repeatable and reproducible in different laboratories through comparative tests run in different labs. Now we have two groups of tests. One group is based on the whole process of aging. 
and that includes accelerated ageing and controlled deterioration. And we have tests based on physiological changes during ageing, electrical conductivity test, tetrazodium staining and radical emergence. So if we start to look at the tests based on the whole process of ageing, starting with accelerated ageing, we have the ASTEP validated test for soybean, which predicts relative storability and emergence. And this increases the rate of ageing using a high temperature, 41 degrees, and a high relative humidity, which will be close to 100%. And because of this high humidity, seed moisture content increases during the test, and the high moisture and high temperature accelerate the rate at which seeds move along that survival curve. And the way in which we do this is to place seeds on a tray, a mesh tray, which stands over water, which is in a perspex box. Then a lid's put on the tray and the trays are put into uh, an incubator. This is usually a water jacketed incubator to ensure that there's a very close con uh, control of temperature. And after the aging periods, the seeds are germinated. And where you have a high germination after aging, this is high vigor seeds, low germination is a low vigor seed and seed lot. And this, in this case, the test time is 11 days. Now in ISTA, soybean is only validated, is the only validated um, for, for accelerated aging. But accelerated aging is also valid, used for other species. For example, you see a lot of species in the uh, Association of Official Seed Analyst Vigor Test Handbook, which was published in 1983. But if you look for recent work using accelerated aging, it has been used for this range of species from a number of cucurbits, uh, beta vulgaris, brassica, pea and maize. And you can find the conditions that were used for accelerated aging of these uh, different species in this recent review in Seed Science and Technology. But now we move to the second test, which is um, involves the whole process of aging, and that is the controlled deterioration test. So this is based on the whole aging process and is validated for brassica species. But there is evidence for its use in many other small seeded species, as you'll see even more later on. But notable as carrot, cucurbits, onion, aubergine and pepper. Now, the basis of the controlled deterioration test is, again, that it speeds up the whole ageing process. But this test controls the conditions of the test more closely than accelerated ageing. And the seeds are deteriorated a specific moisture content, 20%. So the moisture content of the seed is raised before the test begins and the seeds are put in foil packets and then then held at a temperature of 45 degrees for 24 hours. Now this means there's a very precise period of deterioration for all the seeds. So if we have our three seed lots again, which have very a similar level, uh, the same precise period of deterioration. Seed lot A, after deterioration, would retain a high germination. Seed lot B, a lower one. And seed lot C would show a large fall in, in uh, germination. So after the period of deterioration, can you reverse that again, please? We go back. After the period of deterioration, you could have a germination test, which involves the two days of deterioration plus a germination test. So depending on the species, this can range from nine to 16 days. Alternatively, you can conduct a conductivity test, which I'll be coming on to later. And this means the test time is only four days. Now, if we look at the evidence that CD test relates to field emergence and storage potential. Here we've got pepper with the field emergence and the controlled deterioration test result. You can see high level of germination after controlled deterioration. You have much better emergence than where you have a lower CD test result. CD test also predicts storage potential. Here we have 
Brassica oleracea vargamifera, that's Brussels sprouts, after eight months storage in ambient conditions in the UK. Here we've got the normal germination of the seeds. And you see it's very a very small spread of germination. But after a controlled deterioration germination, a high level of CD means that the seeds retain a higher level of germination after storage than these lots, which had a low CD test result. We can see the same thing in onion here. Can you go back again, please? Same thing here again with onion after 14 months storage. Go back to the graphs, please. Normal germination, very limited range, and again, CD germination, high CD germination, high vigour, retains a high germination after 14 months. The low germination before uh, of CD germination means you have much poorer storage potential. So CD relates to both field emergence and storage potential. And if we look then, the next slide, The control deterioration test, go back, has been applied to a number of species since 2000. And you can see again here a number of cucurbits, aubergine, brassica, soybean, which I wouldn't normally use CD for, it's such a large species, but lentil, carrot and lettuce. And again, you can find details of this in uh, the reference in seed science and technology. Now, if we move on to the next test, the next slide, uh, we've got, uh, we've, we're going to look at tests based on physiological changes during aging, the conductivity test, tetrasolium and radical emergence. Now, first of all, we look at the conductivity test. In the next slide. Now, conductivity test is based on differences in leakage due to seed aging. So if we come back again to the seed survival curve, and if we select seeds from different points on that survival curve, and we imbibe the seeds and soak them in tetrazoleum chloride to reveal how much living tissue is present, if we take seeds which are physiologically young at the beginning of the survival curve, we we'll get a nice pink staining. A little later, we get very dark staining. Here we've got the beginning of the presence of dead tissue, more dead tissue, and a lot of dead tissue. Now, over the whole of this period, we've got increased leakage. In the early stages, this increase in leakage is due to membrane deterioration. And as mystic membranes deteriorate, this means that more stain can penetrate into the cotyledons, so you get a deeper red stain that you see here. And if you cut the cotyledons in half, you can see that the stain penetrates further here than earlier on in an aging process. So you get increased leakage here. As you get deterioration and the appearance of more and more dead tissue, you get a further increase in leakage. And this increase in leakage can be tested in the conductivity test. So if you put, press... And in the con oh, go back, please. In the conductivity test, we use four replicates of 50 seeds, which are put in 250 mils of deionized or distilled water, and the conductivity is measured after 24 hours. And we can see in the next slide that how well the test relates to vigor in phaseolus, soybean, and chickpea. So here we've got the uh, emergence and conductivity, high leakage, low vigour, low leakage, high vigour. Again here, poor emergence where you've got high leakage, good emergence with uh, low leakage. For chickpea here, we've got the same picture, poor emergence with low leakage, with high leakage, but we've also got here the mean emergence time, so you can see that those seed lots which are low vigour also take longer to emerge. So low vigour seeds emerge slowly and have a low final emergence compared to the more rapid emergence and the higher 
emergence of the seedlots with a lower conductivity. Now EC mainly relates to grain legumes, but it also relates to radish and radish is a validated species within ISTA. And in this case, the EC is measured after only 17 hours and related to emergence, you can see the same as we saw in um, the grain legumes, low leakage, good emergence with poorer emergence at high levels of leakage. But in radish, we've also had the uh, it, it conductivity related to storage potential, which you can see in the next part of this slide. And here seeds have been stored for 12 months at 25 degrees. This is, these aren't good conditions, but it illustrates the, fact, the deterioration of the seeds in store. So here is the germination after storage related conductivity. And you can see where you have high vigor seed predicted from the conductivity. You get much better storage potential than where you have a higher leakage where germination has fallen as a result of uh, storage. Now, in the, now, this suggests that EC is potential um, test for brassica species. We've illustrated that here in radish. We've also seen it ourselves in cauliflower, and we believe it could be in other species of brassica as well. Now, recent work in which conductivity has been applied actually it only covers four species. Um, which is, includes um, leguminosae and onion. Now, we believe that conductivity is possibly only applicable to seeds with large living cotyledons. And that means where the cotyledons are large and living relative to the overall size of the seed. So where we have the brassics, you have a large area of uh, living cotyledon tissue as well as the living embryo axis. And that applies to these other legumes here. Now with onion, that's a monocot and it does have an endosperm. But in this case, you have a very large living cotyledon relative to the size of the endosperm. So this is probably why conductivity works here. I believe that where you have a large endosperm and only a small living embryo axis, it's unlikely that conductivity would apply because the leakage from the large endosperm would mask any changes in the embryo axis. Now we come to the tetrasodium test, and this is based on the reduction in respiratory activity as seeds age. Now we've already seen that respiring cells can be revealed by tetrasodium chloride staining, which we saw in the peas, and you get a medium red is determined as high vigor, Deep red, as we saw in peas, damage or deterioration, unstayed, dead. Now, this is validated only for vigor evaluation in soybean, but it's a test that's used extensively in South America for a wide range of species. But you'll see in the next slide that we imbibe the seed in tetrazolium chloride and then assess the staining as high, medium or low based on the intensity, extension and depth of colour. But it's important to emphasise that quite a lot of experience is needed and it'd be very hard to actually develop this test on your own. It's useful to have somebody who's experienced it in the test to guide you. So here we've got just a schematic uh, illustration of um, what we mean by differences in vigour. Here we've got uniform staining throughout. Now that would be high vigour where you start to get an area of dead tissue or several areas, it becomes medium, low vigour, you get a more extensive area of dead tissue or many areas of dead tissue. So we move on now to the next slide. And we come to the radical emergence test, which is validated for radish, all seed rape, maize and wheat. Now, this is based in, on the germination progress curves. Now here we've got a germination progress curve for maize. Just hold off adding anything. Don't add anything else, please. Uh, and you've got three seed lots, commercial seed lots of maize. And you can see that they differ very much in their progress curve during germination. We've got two seed lots here. 
which germinate very rapidly to a high level of radical emergence. One here that doesn't takes a long time before it germinates, although it also reaches a high level. Now, these differences in germination progress curves are due to ageing. Now, a notable aspect of these seeds, seed lots, is this time here, which we call the lag period. And it's the time before you get the appearance of the radical. These two seed lots, it's a relatively short lag period compared to this long lag period here. Now we can describe the whole of that germination progress curve on the basis of this mean germination time, which expresses the number of newly germinated seeds at any time, multiplied by the time that it set, stays as they were set to germinate. This gives you the mean germination time, and this actually represents the lag period. So mean germination time and the lag period are exactly the same thing. And we can see that the mean length of this lag period differs between commercial lots here, and the aging increases the lag period, it increases the mean germination time and the spread of germination. Now in this graph, every reading was taken visually over the four, every six hours over 144 hours. Now that involves taking readings during the night, which obviously wouldn't be very appealing to many people, particularly seed analysts or anyone developing the test. So it is possible to do automated assessment of germination progress curves, which we'll see in the next slide. And this automated germination monitoring has been done by the official seed testing station in France since 2005. And they do red, green, blue digital imaging in Jacobson incubators, which we have here. There's cameras above here. And they're able to take photographs of the seeds which are placed on germination papers and then take automated pictures every two hours. And this gives a high throughput and this it has thermal precision, it's repeatable and you're germinating on top of paper. Now the next slide shows you a typical automated germination progress curve for oilseed rape. And again, like the others, I can measure and see differences in between the seed lots. And you can identify a number of times when there's very clear differences between the seed lots in their radical emergence. Now here we've selected clear differences at 30 hours and that single count of radical emergence after 30 hours predicts the mean germination time. That means that the single count at one time predicts the whole pattern of the germination curve. And the coefficient determination of R squared is 0.91%, now 0.91, which means that 91% of the differences in mean germination time can be accounted for by a regression on radical emergence. So radical emergence predicts mean germination time well. So when we have a low RE here, or a long lag period, you have a high mean germination time. Where we have a high RE here, we have a short lag period and a lower mean germination time. We move on now. Now that single count of RE not only predicts the germination progress curve, but it predicts field emergence. That means we can use it as a bigger test. Here we've got field emergence and radical emergence after 30 hours for oilseed rape again. This is a seven day count in the field. This is the final emergence in the field. Now you can see where you have a high RE after 30 hours. You have very early rapid emergence and you have a high final emergence. Where you have a low RE, the seed lots emerge more slowly. Go back, please. And you have a low final emergence. Now, this relationship between radical emergence and field emergence we've seen in many different species. 
We go to the next slide. Here I've put our four validated species up at the top. And then we've got a range of other species, cotton, alfalfa, rice, cucurbits. This gives you the time of the radical emergence count at different temperatures. And here we've got the R squared or the level of prediction of uh, final emergence from the um, radical, radical emergence and the significance. And you can see that radical emergence reliably predicts the differences in emergence in all cases for these species. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to just draw your attention to the significance of radical emergence in relation to seedling growth and growth, seedling growth tests, which prepare growth at a specific time, because radical emergence explains those differences in seedling growth. Where we have high vigor seeds, we have early radical emergence. So there's a longer time for seedling growth before that is measured at this specific time. So we have large seedlings. Where we have low radical emergence, we have a low mean germination time and uniform radical emergence, giving very uniform seedlings. Now that contrasts with low vigor seeds, where we've seen you have a lower radical emergence later radical emergence. So that means there's a shorter time for seedling growth before it's assessed. Therefore, the seedlings are smaller. And the higher mean germination time means radical emergence isn't uniform, so you get variable seedlings. So radical emergence alone can tell you the differences in vigour which are currently assessed by seedling growth. And that means that Radical emergence could be used in place of a seedling growth test, as it is much quicker and is the basis of the seedling growth test. Now, in the next slide, we can see that radical emergence test, which is the most recent test introduced into the vigor hand into ISTA rules, but it's been applied to many species since 2000. And you can see the whole list here. And if you want to find out the conditions which were used for the radical emergence test, the temperature, the timing for the RE uh, assessment, you can find that in this review in Seed Science and Technology. If you could have the next slide, please. Now, I want to bring some of these things together to discuss the ageing repair hypothesis. We'll go back first to our seed survival curve, and we've got our seed lots in different positions along here. And the position of the seed lots on that curve are determined by seed ageing. And they can be determined by accelerated ageing, CD, conductivity, or cetrazolium staining. But the other impact of that period of ageing is this germination, these differences in germination progress curves and the differences in the lag period. Now, it's been proposed that during the lag period of all seeds, metabolic repair takes place before the radical emerges. Now, when you have a low vigor seed, which is more aged and therefore more deteriorated, the need for radical repair will be greater. And that's why you have a longer period before radical emergence. Here you have little deterioration present needed to repair. Therefore, radical emergence occurs quickly. Here, there's more deterioration present that needs repair. So we have a longer period before radical emergence takes place. <coughs> so what is the evidence for repair? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, first of all, a long time ago in 1970, Professor Villiers stored dormant lettuce seeds. And he found that dry seeds accumulated chromosome abnormalities, but imbibed seeds showed no abnormalities. And his hypothesis was that metabolic repair occurred during storage of the imbibed seeds, so membranes and DNA were repaired. There is evidence of DNA repair more recently in the lag period before radical emergence in rye, 
which was shown by Daphne Osborne in the 1980s and 90s, and more recently in Arabidopsis mutants. But there's also evidence for membrane repair and shown in radish and oilseed rape. What you find is that this high leakage always associated with a higher MGT or a lower vigour. But if you give those seeds a brief hydration dry and drying treatment, leakage is reduced. And it's suggested that reduction in leakage was a result of repair occurring during that hydration drying treatment. Now, if we move on to the next slide, we can actually interpret vigor tests by the aging repair hypothesis, starting off with these ISTA validated tests. Now, for aging, accelerated aging, controlled deterioration, we can explain the result of the test by the hypothesis of aging and the position of the seed lot on the survival curve. And that will determine the normal germination after aging. For the conductivity test, we can say the result in terms of leakage from dead or damaged tissue and dead seeds following aging. In radical emergence, as we've just discussed, you can explain the differences in the results by the need for the time for repair of aging in low vigor lots. And in tetrazoonium staining, the vigorous seeds, we know it's due to the pattern of living or dead tissue as seeds age. But if we move on and look at some of the well-known non-validated tests in the next slide. First of all, saturated salt accelerated aging, like normal accelerated aging, we can explain the results in terms of the position of lots on the survival curve. But we think about the cold test, where we count the normal and abnormal seedlings and dead seeds. Remember, aged seeds need repair. Now, at the low temperature of the cold test, there'll be incomplete repair, particularly in anaerobic conditions. And that will increase the number of abnormal seedlings. So in the low vigor seeds, we won't get so much repair will increase the abnormal seedlings and that will be revealed in the result. A similar principle applies for the cool test of cotton, where you do an assessment of the length of the normal seedlings. Where you have this lower temperature, there'll be incomplete repair and you'll get smaller seedlings produced. And the seedling size or uniformity test, seedling growth test, as we've already explained, this can be explained in terms of the timing of radical emergence. So now we'll move on to look at the future development of vigor tests and consider automation for the radical emergence test and molecular methods. So first of all, we look at automation in the radical emergence test. And the next slide, we look at some results that we've achieved using red, green, blue image analysis of cauliflower, where we used an imaging count at 20 degrees at both uh, 72 and 96 hours. Now, here we've got the relationship between field emergence and radical emergence after the RGB count. This is an early emergence count. This is a late, the final emergence count. And you can see that where you get a high RE assessment through the RGB image analysis, we've got early emergence and a high final emergence. In contrast to where you have a low RE count, you have much slower emergence and a low final emergence. And we see the same relationship at 72 and 96 hours, although at 96 hours, the spread of RE is much smaller and it's possibly easier to differentiate between the lots if you use the earlier count. Here we've got the relationship of RE to plug emergence. The solid line is the final emergence. You can see higher final emergence for high RE. This line is the size of the seedlings. And you can see where you've got earlier emergence, you've got 
uh, earlier re sorry i'll start that again where you've got a high radical emergence you've got longer seedlings than where you had a low radical emergence again the same applies if you look at the count at 96 hours but the spread of the re is sufficiently small that it's easier to detect differences where you've got the bigger differences at 72 hours now if we move on to the next slide we'll see that this what we've found is this re assessment predicts figure in five brassicaceae you saw the data for cauliflower in the last slide we've also looked at cabbage mustard radish and chinese cabbage and we've got this um, paper in preparation now but in all cases we get a significant relationship between a radical emergence count at 20 degrees although the timing differs for each species and an expression of vigor either field emergence an early or late count of plug emergence or seedling height now if we move on the next slide We've also looked at automation of radical emergence assessments using multispectral imaging at 20 degrees using the videometer lab, which we've got here. Now, multispectral imaging uses a much wider wavelength of light compared to RGB. And this is detected by the, uh, the CSER um, examined using the videometer lab. You can see the CSER put on filtered papers in petri dishes before they're examined. And the next slide, we see the, the principle of this um, process, which I must point out as 96% accuracy. If you compare the assessment by um, uh, multispectral imaging and a visual Im a, a manual count, you get 96% accuracy. So here we've got the sphere of the videometer. We have different wavelengths of light, a camera detecting and the sample here so we produce an image and the regions are labeled you have to go through segmentation and you get eventually a picture of the seeds and this is a paper that we've just submitted to seed science and technology and we look at the relationship between field emergence and the automated count for cauliflower and cabbage you see very clearly what we saw with the manual assessment where you have a high re here you get good emergence lower re much poorer emergence so multispectral imaging as well as rgb imaging can assess re and predict bigger we have the next slide please so in terms of assessment of radical emergence it's perfectly acceptable to do a manual assessment as we see in the ISTA rules and this is what is possible in every ISTA lab or every laboratory. You can also use, however, automated assessment of radical emergence using either RGB imaging or multispectral imaging. And this is an approach that some labs might wish to try looking at. Now, if we move on to the next slide, it comes to possible development of molecular methods. And there's two areas of research emphasis. The first is proteomics using Arabidopsis thaliana. And a good review of this can be found in Raju 2012. And he, they concluded that stored mRNAs, proteins, and de novo transcription contribute to successful establishment. And they had the view that proteomics and other omics studies may identify markers of seed quality. But the problem for me is that they used aged seeds of Arabidopsis. There was no evidence from crop species that any of these uh, 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 analyses related to vigor. Two crop species have been investigated, sugar beet and alfalfa, but in each case, only one lot was used and the seeds were artificially aged. The next slide shows you that the other approach has been to look at repair during germination of Arabidopsis. And this has identified, first of all, two ligases that are involved in repair pathways, which remove DNA damage. 
and they concluded that ligase is a major determinant of Arabidopsis seed quality. Subsequently, uh, their research identified two checkpoint kinases, which activate checkpoints that stop or delay cell cycle progression. So what you would imagine would be that growth could be delayed as a result of these checkpoint kinases, which would then facilitate repair by these ligases. And maybe the ligases or the kinases could be used as uh, as to identify differences in vigour. But again, this work has only been done in Arab Arabidopsis. Could I have the next slide, please? So, in terms of molecular markers, potential markers may have been identified, but these have only been identified in the model species Arabidopsis. No work has been done on crop species developing, differing in quality. So at the moment, we can't say that any of these markers could be used as in a vigor test. So we're looking to new approaches to vigor testing. I'd like to emphasize that initial work may use aged or prime seeds or model species. And that may indicate the potential for a molecular marker. But if that's going to be a practical value, you've got to move on. And that will be followed by work using seed from crop or horticultural species that's used in practice, i.e. it's got to be shown to be effective in commercial seed lots. And any potential test should reveal differences in a large number of commercial seed lots. And though any test, the results should relate to an expression of vigour in these seed lots. So this really asks for collaboration between perhaps people with more molecular interest in seed science and people with a, an interest in practical application of that molecular knowledge. Now to conclude, we've seen that differences in vigour influence establishment and yield, and vigour tests identify vigour differences using aspects of seed ageing. And I'd like to emphasise that these observations have been made in a very wide range of species. The ageing repair hypothesis explains vigour differences and the results of vigour tests. And that there is potential for automation of the RE vigour test through RGB imaging or multispectral imaging. And it may be possible that we could have molecular markers of seed vigour. But this does require further work using commercial crop or horticultural seed material. And then I'd like to say now in the next slide. Thank you to the ISTA Vigor Committee. And many of these people have contributed to the background research or to comparative tests to validate some of our seed tests. You'll see we come from a range of countries from South America, North America, a lot of it in Europe, and you see as a representative of India, Dr. Jagadish from Indo-American Hybrid Seeds. Then in the next slide, I'd just like to do a bit of advertising for the Easter annual meeting this year in Verona in Italy, but perhaps more importantly, the Easter Congress, which will be in New Zealand in 2025. And included within this is a seed research symposium. Now, I know many of you are doing research and you might think of this as a, a target for a poster or an oral presentation. Many of you will be students and you will find that there is a scheme within ISTA called Young ISTA, which can allow you to apply for funds to possibly come to the Congress. Now, that was my advertising. So I'd just like to finish now saying thank you to all of you for your patience at the beginning of this presentation and for all the hiccups perhaps through it and thank you for your attention thank you very much thank you madam for your elaborated motivating lecture and for sharing the information and your experience in the field of seed physiology and seed vigor with us really it is uh, highly helpful for enlightening the students now the session is open for discussion 
participants are requested to interact with our guest speaker friends those who are all attending through online also requested to post your questions and also you can directly interact with our guest speaker vanakkam uh, dr powell are you hearing me yes i'm hearing you uh, i am vanangamudi i have some uh, doubt on your uh, accelerated aging that is a technical doubt okay yes, hello yes yeah yes for uh, delaushi and uh, baskin and uh, normally we are uh, quoting referring uh, their literature for accelerated aging in that they recommended the temperature of 40 degree celsius plus or minus 1 degree celsius and the uh, relative humidity of uh, 95% plus or minus 2% uh, this is the actual uh, the temperature uh, and uh, relative humidity requirement for uh, accelerated aging okay yeah well that was the yeah those yeah, are the conditions also, established sorry go on yeah i also worked with uh, their laboratory during 1988 and 1990 and they also told the same uh, requirements for accelerated aging but from your slide i noticed that the temperature is 45 degree celsius no uh, well, from my knowledge uh, please please wait listen uh, i will complete my question okay okay uh, from my knowledge for uh, seed drying the optimum temperature is 40 to 42 degree celsius and if you expose the seeds to 45 degree celsius that will kill the not only kill that damages the internal structure of the seed especially the fissures seed fissures seed coat fissures okay am i correct well i think first of all you've mixed up aa and cd for i i have not mixed up i yeah. mixed up that what i wanted to tell 45 degree temperature yeah. is higher from my point of view but i have some question and that temperature requirement is different from uh, country to country or if it is a temperate country like uh, you your country and the temperature is 45 and the temperature of the tropical countries like us the india the, yeah. uh temperature is 42 40 degree that's what i understood i have this doubt can you please uh, clarify my doubt right well first of all for deal, dealing with accelerated aging the okay. the conditions for accelerated aging that we have validated are 41 degrees and above water which i say close to 100% is never 100% it's perhaps between 95 and 100%. The conditions yeah. that we we use in ISTA are ones which were rigorously investigated in the United States more recently than Dilution Baskin's work and mainly I think at the University of Kentucky um as be uh, Dennis Tacroni and Tim Leffler and the we adopted their conditions of 41 degrees for 72 hours over water which gives between 95 and 100% relative humidity okay. with the test was the, the test was then done in a range of labs using those precise conditions to ensure that we had um repeatable and reproducible results so the test was validated under these conditions uh that's why we may differ to um what dilution baskin originally used but things have developed since then the 45 degrees that you referred to is used for control deterioration where the seeds are hydrated at 20 degrees at uh, 20 to 20% and we are aging the seeds 
and those precise conditions of a high moisture content 20% and 45 degrees centigrade are used in the control deterioration test. And again, that we know they're aging the seeds and that is what we want to do. And the test again has been repeated in more than six labs to validate the test to make sure it's uh, we're getting repeatability and reproducibility. And since then, it's been involved in um, ISTA tests for um, checking labs' uh, ability to do it, where you've had 20 labs assessing seed quality using CD and getting comparable results. So it, it are conditions that give comparable results for the test. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, good answer. And by and large, your presentation is excellent uh, presentation. I congratulate you as well as Dr. Manon Mani, the head of the Department of Seed Science and Technology, as well as Dr. Umarani, Director Seed Center, for arranging your presentation. Thanks. We enjoyed a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Powell. This is Sukumar from IRI. Uh, it is always a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, we have been listening to you for long. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation, and we are always benefited having listened to you. Particularly, one point uh, which made you clear was about uh, advantage, uh, rather disadvantage of having low vigor seed in transplanted crops. Whenever we used to say talk, uh, people say there is no use of uh, say seed quality enhancement in the crops where transplanting is being done because you are already rejecting them. But uh, unpredictable number of uh, transplants is a very important point you gave. Thank you for that. I have two small queries, if you please. Uh, one gave a reference of uh, say chickpea 92 to 100% germination, but 43 to 78% field emergence. So in your paper, uh, you must have, uh, say, uh, talked about or wrote that, was it, uh, say, 92% germination, which resulted in 43, or was it 100%, then why? What was the reason of uh, having less uh, field emergence? You might have assigned reasons for that. So oh. uh, I'd like to listen. Well, the C, well, we we have done the emergence of the chickpea, I must admit, in unusual circumstances, because it was done in probably in the summer in Scotland. We don't usually grow chickpeas, but we, we would, uh, the field emergence trial would take place in the summer where it'd be a bit warmer. But they would be sown into, um, let's say, adverse conditions when perhaps there's going to be quite a lot of rain. And though that would create stress conditions for the seeds in the field and the low vigor seeds don't cope with stress conditions particularly anaerobic conditions and that gave the low emergence for the low vigor seed has it something to uh, uh, do with the mother plant or the maturation uh, the environment at maturation oh. or no that that wouldn't be anything that um, we could have assessed because we received seeds uh, the chickpea seeds they came from i can't remember where they came from and they were Ethiopian in origin. It was an Ethiopian student who did the work, so he would have brought commercial seeds with him. So we wouldn't know the background to all the seeds, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's the only the only problem of working with seeds that uh, overseas students bring with you. You can't always investigate what the background of the seed is. All right. Uh, two tests, particularly the accelerated aging and PZ, have been uh, tested, verified by ESTA as a bigger test in soybean. Well, we, we've, we've validated uh, soybean, you, you, but yeah, those, you, are those two, yeah. Those two tests. Say, yeah. if I want to test, uh, go for one test, which test should I? Mm, well, for soybean, I say conductivity is the most, it's the simplest and most straightforward. And you can give the instructions of a conductivity test to somebody new in a seed testing lab and they'll get a good result. If you somebody who is inexperienced is given an AA or a tetrazodium test to do, they don't find it so easy. <laughs> yeah. 
They can always do conductivity. Of course, course tetrazoline is too tricky to handle. Yeah. Uh, thank we're you actually, so much. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank nice you. to see you. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, Ma'am, regarding that uh, oh. multispectral imaging system, so uh, some of the people, they are, uh, they are uh, doing only with that imaging alone. Some of them, they are uh, going for that uh, uh, spectrophotometric way of uh, that measurement. They are going for uh, that uh, collecting that uh, reflectance as well as transmissions. So uh, mm -hmm. what about in your case? You are collecting only that uh, uh, images alone or uh, you are getting that uh, uh, spectral data? I'm afraid I can't answer that. I've not done it. Um, I think they're only collecting the images. I don't think they're collecting anything else. Um, this was work that was, uh, we uh, worked very closely with the official seed testing station in France and uh, the work was conducted there because they had the equipment. I think they're just con collecting the images, I, but I can't confirm that. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, okay, ma'am. Uh, regarding that oxalated aging test, uh, uh, in some other cases, the people, they are using that water alone for creating that uh, late humidity. Uh, in some other cases, they are using salt solutions, uh, sodium chloride solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that, they are uh, the people, they are started using uh, different chemicals for creating that particular atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So based on your uh, experience, uh, which one uh, is uh, much useful for determining the vigor of the seeds? Well, the saturated salt test is mainly used by people who want to test small seeded species. Because if you try to do a, the standard accelerated aging with small seeded species, their moisture content goes up far too high because of the very high humidity. So this is why people started to use um, saturated salts, because they create a lower relative humidity. And at the lower relative humidity, the smaller seed species don't show such a big increase in moisture content. So it, I won't say that one is better than the other. It just depends on the species that you're dealing with. I mean, if you're dealing with a small flower species, small seeded flower species or small seeded vegetable species, I would say we'd look for a saturated salt approach. If you're dealing with peas, beans, you would look for maize, you'd look for straightforward normal accelerated aging. It really just depends on the size of your seed. Okay, ma'am. Is it possible to get any data through salt aggregated uh, aging uh, oh, yeah. in uh, in comparison with the storing of the seeds near seashore areas, because there uh, we are having a similar kind of atmosphere. Uh, can we correlate these two data? Is it possible? Correlate the data between saturated salt aging, salt saturated aging, as well as that, uh, that that there we are going to get some data. That is it. Uh, that uh, storability related data we oh. can get it. So oh. uh, can we correlate that particular data with that uh, the seed storing nearer to the seashore areas? I would, th I would have thought so, yes. Yes. Is it possible to correlate that one? Whether we can get any 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 related information? Are you asking, is there information already or would you be able to put that data together? Yes. I'm not perhaps not quite understanding you. It, but I think it's something that's possible to do. So if you want to do it, go ahead. But are you asking me, have, has somebody else already done that? Okay, 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 ma'am. We will try. Yes, yes. Okay. I have uh, another question. There are a lot of variation in seed size hmm? among agricultural, horticultural, and forest crops. Even within the agriculture, horticulture, and forest crop, there exist uh, the seed size differences. And uh, do you have any relationship with the seed size and the accelerated aging? Again, uh, that will be related to vigor testing. Uh, in general, there isn't a clear effect of seed size on vigor. But if you're doing accelerated aging, the um, directions for carrying out the test are for using um, I think for a weight of seeds, not a number of seeds, because they get a difference in the result depending on whether you use, no, you use a number of seeds, not a weight of seeds, because you get a difference in the results 
depending on what, which approach you use. But so because if you use a, a weight of seeds, you'll get far more seeds for a small seeded lot than a large seeded lot. So we have to be very precise and carry out the test about how you do it. But I'm not aware of any clear evidence of there ever of there being an effect of uh, seed size on the actual bigger of the seed. That area is not explored so far. <laughs> well, it has been the effect of seed size on bigger has been looked at extensively, but. There's no evidence that, it, that there is a clear relationship between seed size and bigger. It depends on the species. Some species so there is an effect, others say there isn't an effect. So you can't make a general statement that larger seeds exactly. are more vigorous than smaller seeds, for example. Exactly, exactly. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. Bye. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, myself Abhinaya, PhD scholar from Department of Seed Science and Technology. Uh, thank you for your elaborate lecture about uh, seed vigor, ma'am. Uh, my question is, we have various vigor tests for seed, but uh, there are some crops where we are using vegetative propagules. So in that case, how can we predict the vigor of that vegetative propagules, ma'am? Is there any test? I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Uh, this is sometimes that get, gets a, a question that is raised to ISTA, but ISTA deals only with true seed, not with vegetative propagules, I'm afraid. So I can't help you. I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, uh, so this uh, question is posted by Dr. V. Uh, Sankaran, sir. Can we assume that, in general, any test based on membrane permeability or leakage works better for large seeded species than the small seeded ones? Please guide it. In general, yeah, any yeah, test. Yeah, 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 I understand. That's all right. I understand yeah, the question. Yes, Just thinking yeah, about yeah. how to express my answer. <laughs> um, you're partly correct, but I think the most important thing is the structure of the seed and how much the seed is made up of living tissue. In something like peas and beans, the whole of the seed is living, the cotyledons and the embryo axis. If you think about brassica species, Again, these are dicots with both the axis and the cotyledons are living. And in these situations, any deterioration of the within the cotyledons may result in an increase in leakage and maybe a reduction in vigor, but the seeds can still germinate. However, if you think about many grass seeds or cereal seeds, they have a large endosperm and a relatively small embryo axis in comparison to the overall size of the seed. So there's very little living tissue present in that seed. Now, there might be some change in the amount of living tissue, that some, so there may be some death, but even with the, because there's such a large dead endosperm or large dead food store, any leakage from the food store will mask any increase in leakage from the small area of living tissue. So I don't think that conductivity could be applied to even large seeds like maize, where you've got a large endosperm and a relatively small embryo axis compared to the whole side of the endosperm that's present. I think you need a, a large living, a living food store as well as a living embryo axis for it to be successful. It doesn't matter on the size of the seed, as we found when we looked at radish, conductivity works. Conductivity appears to be applicable to cauliflower as well, and probably other brassics. Much smaller seeds than the peas and beans, but they have the similar seed structure. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, next question posted by Dr. Uh, Shakti Vail. The question is, is there any AI-based software for self-life prediction in commercial applications? Hmm. Not that I know of. And I only know of these sort of predictions of shelf life from doing things like the uh, viability equations, but I you know I don't know about any software that helps predict shelf life. I mean, any all our vigor tests, they don't predict actual shelf life. They predict uh, the relative shelf life. This will store better than that one. It won't steal you an actual sort of prediction. 
in of actual germination after storage in particular conditions for a specific length of time. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question is uh, posted by Dr. V. Uh, Sankaran, sir. Do we have an authentic list of crop species classified based on their normal seed vigor potential inherent in the species? No, <laughs> no, we don't. I, I don't think we have in uh, good vigor, reliable vigor tests haven't been used on a wide enough range of um, species to be able to do anything like that. There's many bigger tests and people have done lots of bigger tests in different species, but we, it, you need to have a, a, a very, I think, a large research program of, of really focusing on that. Then we don't, we wouldn't have that at the moment. And, uh, Dr. Vanangamudi, and do you have any collaborative program or any research program to work our students at your lab? Unfortunately not, because I'm actually retired from the university. I'm an honorary member of staff. So research that I'm involved with at the moment is always with people in other labs. You, even though you have retired, you have a very good contact with uh, your university or some other universities. <laughs> not, not with so our that, own uh, university. There's no seed research in Aberdeen University since I retired. Um, but okay. we would have... So is it's contact with people in different labs in Europe uh, that we tend to work with. So I'm at a distance from them, but we do discuss work and arrange research. Is it possible you can discuss with your uh, uh, friends and uh, kindly arrange? If possible, if possible, you can discuss with your friends and arrange for some students the intake program. Well, yes, I can. Make, the problem it often is that the the um, labs aren't always um, reliable English speakers. They may, the people I interact with are, but maybe the whole lab isn't. Um, the, the I can I can bring it to the attention of a couple of the labs that would be appropriate. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank you. I also retired from service. I also oh, right. retired from service. <laughs> you still stay active, though, from, can't you? Yeah, I retired from service in 2013, about 10 years ago. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. Actually, first of all, I, I want to thank for your wonderful lecture. Myself, Vinod, from the Department of Seasons and Technology, Research Scholar. Actually, I have a clarification on what basis we fix the first count and final count for the seeds, uh, especially for medicinal crops. Oh, gosh. I think medicinal crops are of greater interest to you in India than they have been within ISTA, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I think we, this is more a question for germination than vigor. But I think for a germination test, the final count would be determined by looking at the um, at a range of species, a range of seed lots of a particular species, and looking to see where you get the maximum germination. Because if it's a germination test, you're looking for the optimal conditions to achieve the maximum potential germination of the seeds. So, my I would imagine that using a number of seed lots in one or more germination conditions and looking for the conditions and the timing that gives you the maximum reading or at some germination and then the first count i'm not quite sure how they determine that i think it's probably looking for where you have a very large proportion of normal seedlings produced like uh, in the ticks the ticks it's a uh, tree species also have the different types of germination they have uh, different types of dormancy so we can't expect uh, 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 a uniform right. germination there right okay well that is very much dependent on how much you develop to dormancy breaking treatment, really, isn't it? You, is it dormancy breaking that you've been looking at? 
Have you looked at dormancy breaking these species? Yes, I'm sorry. So what have you think? looked? You know, have you been looking at dormancy breaking in these species? Because you need a dormancy breaking treatment before you do a yes, germination test. That's yes, when we did. Yeah. Well, I think what you would always do is have do your German dormancy breaking before you do your germination test and use the different treatments. And again, just look the different conditions after dormancy breaking that give you the maximum germination. And when you get the time that gives you the maximum germination, that's your final count. OK, thank you, ma'am. It might mean waiting a long time. That's some, that's the only problem with some species that germinate very slow. Christine, uh, we thank all the participants and guest speaker for their effective interaction. Now we would like to invite uh, our uh, beloved professor, Dr. R. Gerlin, Department of Seed Science and Technology, to offer vote of thanks. Thank you, Kavita. Honorable Chief Guests of today's event, Dr. N. Sendil, Dean SPGS, Dr. R. Umarani, Director Seed Center, Dr. Manon Mani, Professor and Head of Department of Seed Science and Technology, my dear participants who have joined on and offline, and dear students, good evening one and all. Madam Dr. Alison Powell, today's distinguished guest speaker, the chair of the SEEDS Science Advisory Group, ISTA. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. So it's my proud privilege to propose the formal vote of thanks. At the outset, I would like to thank immensely our Dean SPGS for arranging these kind of lectures of international uh, importance. Thank you, sir, for, for your keen interest in uh, facilitating all these academic activities. And our heartfelt gratitude to our respected director, Seed Center, who always encourages all the scientists and students in all our academic activities and also for rendering great support for all programs that will widen our knowledge on science. It's our bounden duty to thank our professor and head of the Department of Seed Science and Technology for her strenuous efforts in arranging this kind of global lecture series for the benefit of the faculty as well as the students. So on behalf of Department of Seed Science and Technology, Seed Center and Tamil Nadu Agricultural University as a whole, I would like to immensely thank Dr. Alison Powell, a renowned seed scientist, honorary ISTA member, chair of Seed Vigor Committee for sparing her valuable time, painstaking efforts for delivering the lecture on seed physiology to seed vigor, which was very impressive and made us all to keep ourselves abreast of all aspects of seed vigor. Thank you, madam. Special thanks to all the faculty of Department of Seed Science and Technology and Seed Center for their unconditional support and coordination. Our thanks are also due to all the non-teaching staff who work hand in hand in all our activities. Our diligent thanks to our students for their active participation and involvement in the discussion. Our heartfelt thanks are due to our retired scientist, Dr. K. Vanangamudi, who always supports us in all our activities and also his active participation in this event. A great appreciation to all the participants who have joined on and offline for your keen interest in the lecture and also for your involvement in the discussions. Our heartfelt gratitude to Dean Agri for providing this lecture hall and also the professor and head department of physical science and the technical staff Rajesh for rendering their support for the successful conduct of this program. Thank you once again. Thank you ma'am for offering a formal vote of thanks. Thank you one and all. The session is closed.